if you believe what the prosecutors want you to believe, you have to believe that O.J. Simpson, who has a limo driver coming, I guess around 10.30, 10.40, after he goes and gets a hamburger at McDonald's, after having been worried about change because he had $100 bills, that he's already been packing because clothes are being brought down and he's taking his golf clubs because he is going to play golf and that makes sense as a pre-planned trip. He's just off the road and going back on the road. That he is perhaps the most recognizable person in Brentwood in that area where he's lived, we know, for 17 years. That he drives a white Bronco. That he decides to put on a knit cap and you saw that exhibition yesterday of him or you or I in a knit cap. He decides he'll put that on. He changes out of his tennis shoes, his Reebok tennis shoes and his sweat socks and puts on some dress socks and puts on some Bruno Magli shoes. And let me just stop right there for a minute, put a pin in that. The Bruno Magli shoes, you heard all about Bruno Magli shoes and Bruno Magli shoes and we searched all around the world and we went to Bloomingdale's and what did we find? There is nobody who ever sold O.J. Simpson any Bruno Magli shoes. They searched, they tried, they never sold him any shoes. So they've just been talking about Bruno Magli shoes. I mean, there must be every other house in Brentwood. If somebody wanted to afford some Bruno Magli shoes, I guess they could. Now, that's, that's, that's their case. There is no evidence that O.J. Simpson had any Bruno Magli shoes ever. In fact, when Lang is looking for the clothes and O.J. Simpson says, this is what I wore, here are the tennis shoes, he took only tennis shoes that night. There are, is no evidence that O.J. Simpson ever owned any Bruno Magli shoes, and please remember that. So he gets, puts these Bruno Magli shoes on, and he's trying to disguise himself, of course. He puts on a pair of gloves that don't fit. And he gets in his car and he decides that what he'll do is he'll drive over to the alleyway behind Bundy where his wife lives in this big Bronco. Now, while he's going to do that, he's been over there a number of times. And you know, they've already told you about Pablo Fenviz and these people who live back there. You remember when you went on that jury view? There are homes and windows and things that face down on that alley on both sides from, I guess, Gretna Green side, and from the Bundy side. People are looking down in that alley. It's well lit. You saw the photograph yesterday of what Mark Storfer would have seen. He pulls into this alleyway, in this Bronco, in this disguise, dressed the way they want to have him dressed. So he's coming to kill his wife. Now, somehow, they're trying to kill his wife or whatever. He doesn't kill her in the back back there where the car is. He goes and lures her to the front gate. Doesn't make any sense, does it? He goes to the front gate to lure her to that front gate. And then he gets into a fight, somebody he doesn't even know. This fight goes on for five to 15 minutes. The fight is so fierce that a hat and a glove are torn off. That's how fierce this fight had to be. The keys, the beeper. You saw how tough it is for in any kind of an altercation for gloves to come off. I had to come off, there's kicking, there's all kind of fighting in this small, small area. But that's what they want you to believe. And so we find the keys and the beeper and the gloves all, the, of course, the, we find specifically the cap and the gloves neatly packaged under the item there. And then he leaves this one glove behind and then just walks slowly out to the alleyway. Now. The dog that we heard so much about, who he bought, who was his dog, doesn't go with him. He goes the other way, out the front to go down the other way. Cato, the dog, under what they would have you believe. And he's got these bloody clothes on and everything. Now he goes back out there where his car has been sitting 10, 15, 20 minutes. Right out there in the alleyway, anybody could look, anybody coming home, people are driving up and down the street. Gets back in his car, then presumably he races back home where the limousine driver who's there doesn't hear him come up, 
doesn't see him, doesn't do any of those things. And we know from the time they see O.J. Simpson, within five minutes, he's da coming downstairs, packed, luggage is already down there, looking neat as a pin, heading for the airport. Now, he was expecting this man after he came back with a hamburger. This is what their case is. This is what they want you to believe. And just for good measure, it's not enough. That's not enough. Under their scenario, once he gets home, after he's rushing, he's got enough time, he's got all these bloody clothes on, he runs down the side of his house, where he's lived for 17 years, and runs into the air conditioning. and says, oops, no, no marks, of course, on his body. But while he's back there, he drops a bloody glove to match the other glove found over at Bundy. And just for good measure, so they'll be sure and find it, he knocks on the wall. He doesn't run into the wall, he knocks on the wall. He says, he gives a signal. Then he decides he comes in the house, but nobody sees him do any of that. That's what they have you believe. That is the prosecution's case. We have been here one year, ladies and gentlemen, and two days to hear this is what they have told you. It just doesn't fit. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. I was thinking last night about this case and their theory and how it didn't make any sense and how it didn't fit and then how something is wrong. And it occurred to me how they were going to come here and stand up here and tell you how O.J. Simpson was going to disguise himself, he was going to put on a knit cap and some dark clothes, and he was going to get in his white Bronco and this recognizable person and go over and kill his wife. That's what they want you to believe. That's how silly their argument is. And I said to myself, maybe I can demonstrate this graphically. I'm going to show you something. This is a knit cap. I'm going to put this knit cap on. And you've been seeing me for a year. If I put this knit cap on, who am I? I'm still Johnny Cochran with a knit cap. And if you look at O.J. Simpson over there, and he has a rather large head, O.J. Simpson in a knit cap from two blocks away is still O.J. Simpson. It's no disguise. It's no disguise. It makes no sense. It doesn't fit. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. The messengers in this case. We talked briefly about Van Adder and about all of his big lies. <clears throat> his lies become very important because he's the co-lead investigator in this case. From the very beginning, he was lying to you. And it was interesting. And I thought about this last night after I left you. Just about 10 days ago, a week or 10 days ago, Van Adder took that stand again, and you saw him. You had a chance to again observe his demeanor, and you're smart. You, you know when somebody's lying and not telling you the truth. I mean, I don't have to go into that. You, you know, you don't need the jury instruction. You've got this visceral reaction. You've got your experiences in life, and you know somebody who's lying. But, you know, he said something really interesting. It was really preposterous when you think about it. He said, Mr. Shapiro, Mr. O.J. Simpson was no more a suspect than you were. Now, now who in here believed that? Did he really think he's going to come back in here and we we're going to believe that, that O.J. Simpson was no more a suspect than Robert Shapiro? That's what he told you. Big lies. You can't trust him. You can't believe anything he says because it goes to the core of this case. When you're lying at the beginning, you'll be lying at the end. The book of Luke talks about that. It talks about if you're untruthful in small things, you should be disbelieved in big things. There's no question about that. We've known that all along. So this man with his big lies, and then we have Furman coming right on the heels, and the two of them need to be paired together because they are twins of deception. Furman and Van Adder, twins of deception, who bring you a message that you cannot trust, that you cannot trust. In short, we talked about reasonable doubt. 
We talked about something that's made this country great, that you can be accused in this country of a crime. But that's just an accusation. And when you enter a not guilty plea, since the beginning of the time of this country, since the time of the Magna Carta, that sets the forces in motion and you have a trial. That's what this has been about. That's why we love what we do. An opportunity to come before people from the community, the consciences of the community. You are the consciences of this community. You set the standards. You tell us what's right and wrong. You set the standards. You use your common sense to do that. Your verdict goes far beyond these doors of this courtroom. As Mr. Darden said, the whole world is watching and waiting for your decision in this case. That's not to put any pressure on you. Just tell you what is really happening out there. So we talked about all of those things. Hopefully in a logical way. Hopefully something I said made some sense to you. Hopefully as an advocate, you know my zeal. You know the passion I feel for this. We've all got time invested in this case. But it's just not about winning. It's about what's right. It's about a man's life at stake here. So in Voidire, you promised to take the time that was necessary, and you've more than done that. When you want to think about the depths to which people will go to try to win, when you want to talk about an obsession to win, I'm going to give you an example. There was a witness in this case named Thano Paradis. This is a man who's their man who took O.J. Simpson's blood. This is a man who had a subpoena at one point, said he could have come down here and testified. They didn't call him. So by the time we wanted to call him, he's unavailable because of his heart problem, remember? So what we did was we read you his grand jury testimony, I believe, and we played for you his preliminary hearing testimony. And in that testimony, he was very, very consistent. Been a nurse for a number of years, you saw him. Works for the city of Los Angeles. Says that when he took this blood from O.J. Simpson on June 13th, he took between 7.9 and 8.1 cc's of blood. That's what he said, that's real simple, isn't it? We knew that, it's sworn, tell the truth, under oath, both places, grand jury and preliminary hearing. Pretty clear, isn't it? Pretty clear. Except you remember that in my opening statement, I told you, I said, you know, something's wrong here. Something sinister is here. Something is wrong. Because if we take all their figures and assume they took eight cc's of blood, the 6.5 cc's accounted for, there is 1.5 cc's missing of this blood. There's some missing blood in this case. Where is it? Prosecution wants to explain that for you, too, make everything real easy for you. So what do they do? What do they do? We've been talking about the police here before, but what do they do? Hank Goldberg doesn't give us any notice. Goes out there with the video camera with Oppler and this other lady, Miss Ramirez. And they take this bizarre home video of Paradis sitting there talking and mouthing words. It's the most bizarre thing. I mean, as jurors, I'm sure you've seen some pretty high quality testimony here, but this was bizarre. He's sitting there talking about, well, you know, gee, I, I don't really remember how much I took, and he's going through all these gyrations. It was sad. The depths to which they had sunk to try, as part of this cover-up, to try and convince you that this man hadn't taken eight cc's of blood. And at the very end of this case, we put in a syringe for you, the kind of syringe they used. And this syringe, it's interesting enough, has markers on it. Not only, this wasn't a guessing game. It has eight cc's right on it. I think it was a 10 cc syringe. So he knew what was taken. But that's the depths to which they will go to try to make it fit. And it just doesn't fit. That's what they'll do. You have to watch them. This is a classic example. You saw it with your own eyes. You heard the testimony. Need I say more?
if he sees an African-American with a white woman, he would stop them. If he didn't have a reason, he'd find one or make up one. This man will lie to set you up. That's what he's saying there. He will do anything to set you up because of the hatred he has in his heart. A racist is somebody who has power over you, who can do something to you. People could have views, but keep them to themselves. But when they have power over you, that's when racism becomes insidious. That's what we're talking about here. He has power. A police officer in the street, a patrol officer, is the single most powerful figure in the criminal justice system. He can take your life. Unlike the Supreme Court, you don't have to go through all these appeals. He can do it right there and justify it. And that's why, that's why this has to be rooted out in the LAPD and every place else. Make up a reason, because he made a judgment. That's what happened in this case. They made a judgment. Everything else after that was going to point toward O.J. Simpson. They didn't want to look at anybody else. Mr. Darden asked, who did this crime? That's their job as the police. We've been hampered. They turned down our office for help. But that's the prosecution's job. The judge says, we don't have that job. The law says that. We'd love to help do that. Who do you think wants to find these murderers more than Mr. Simpson? But that's not our job. It's their job. And when they don't talk to anybody else, when they rush to judgment and their obsession to win, that's why this became a problem. This man had the power to carry out his racist views. And that's what's so troubling. Let's move on. Making up a reason. That's troubling. That's frightening. That's chilling. But if that wasn't enough, if that wasn't enough, the thing that really gets you, is she goes on to say, Officer Furman went on to say that he would like nothing more than to see all niggers gathered together and killed. He said something about burning, burning them or bombing them. I was too shaken to remember the exact words he used. However, I do remember that what he said was probably the most horrible thing I'd ever heard someone say. What frightened me even more was that he was a police officer, sworn 